as a sleep. Welcome to Sound Stations. Please pick up a pair of headphones and be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, get ready to meet all your favorite Disney stars as the Magic Kingdom proudly presents Disney Mania. Direct from New York City on the planet Zork, put your hands together for sunny eclipse. Ah, welcome, weary travelers, to the great big universe of XS. Hey, 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 this week's show was going to be just a little bit different due to this weekend's Magic Meet, so there won't be any news or emails due to when I had to record and get the show up, but I promise to make up for it next week as I already have a whole lot of news to cover and tons of your emails to get through. My apologies again for the delay in getting them read on the air. Now, unlike last week's show, where there was one really detailed segment, there's a whole bunch of great topics to cover this week with plenty of special guests, including Walt Disney World Fact or Fiction with Cody Pepper, who proves that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and hidden treasures of Walt Disney World with Gary Chambers. This week's visit to the Walt Disney World rumor mill is full of exciting and interesting rumors about the Disney MGM Studios, Spaceship Earth, Space Mountain, and more. In our Character Connection segment, Jeff Pepper and I talk about the duck behind the magic of Mickey's Toontown Fair, Cornelius Coop. Jonathan Dichter's Voices Behind the Magic covers the talented Angela Lansbury, and Mike Scopa joins me for another best of the best. This time, it's the best general rule for touring the parks. We'll also announce the winner of our first Walt Disney World Half Marathon Challenge Contest and introduce our second challenge, where you can play for a chance to win great prizes and entry to win our grand prize at the end of the contest. Thanks to Eric Hollister from GeoMouse.com. This is going to help make a child's wish come through through his donations to the DisneyWorldTrivia.com Dream Team Project. So sit back. Relax, and I hope you enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. And now, a trip to the Walt Disney World Rumor Mill. We'll start off this week's visit to the Walt Disney World Rumor Mill with a combination of some news and rumors, as in the DisneyWorldTrivia.com forums, it's been reported and there are photos of the new touchscreen ordering systems at quick service locations in the Magic Kingdom. It looks like Disney is testing these systems at Pagos Bill's Tall Tale Inn and Cafe, also known as the Best Burgers on Property, in Frontierland. Four of the kiosks have been installed and will allow diners to eliminate the cast members as part of the ordering process. Use the touchscreen and either use a credit card or your Key to the World card in order to pay for your meal. Go up to the front and get your food. Uh, I'll post uh, a link up in the show notes where you can get the pictures and more information over at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. We don't know if these will be there on a trial basis or be there permanently and what other quick service locations may be getting them in the future. It's rumored that when the Canada Pavilion in Epcot opens up after a brief refurb to update their film on August 25th, Martin Short, the comedian, may be the new narrator. Now, this very well may not bode well for the new movie, as Martin has been in two other films in Walt Disney World that are now history. One was The Making of Me in the Wonders of Life Pavilion, and the other was The Monster Sound Show. It is expected that, unlike uh, the loss of the original narrator, it is expected that O Canada Song will remain, but has been re-recorded. Over at the Disney MGM Studios, it appears that another rumor may be coming true this week, as it is expected that Mickey Avenue will be officially announced as changing its name to Pixar Place in the upcoming weeks. Also at the studios, it appears that there's going to be a new quick-service pizza restaurant uh, coming near or at the streets of America, which of course begs the question as to what may happen to the current Toy Story Pizza Planet. Will it be changed, moved, or rethemed, or brought over to this area? Time will obviously have to tell. Also, speaking of MGM and Pixar... 
Remember, folks, Pixar is now part of Disney, so please don't shoot the messenger when I keep talking about Pixar. It has vaguely been rumored that the Backlot Tour may close next year permanently and be yanked out if the rumored Pixar Place expansion takes place. Jedis once again have even more reason to rejoice this week, as the rumored upgrade to Star Tours seems to be getting some more details, or maybe it's just wishful thinking that's making its way around the internet. Rumors about what may take place include the adding of five rear-projected digital 3D screens with one screen in the front and two smaller screens on both left and right sides of the simulator, as well as hydraulic lifts at the center rear area of the simulator. You also now have to wear 3D, uh, themed 3D glasses, similar to PhilharMagic, uh, which seems to be consistent with the trend with things like Toy Story Mania coming to the other side of the parks using similar technology. The audio system is also going to be upgraded to DTS HD Master Audio System Sound inside the simulator, as well as a DTS HD Master Audio External System, which is used when the simulator hatches are supposed to be in the open position. Also, the front projected IMAX dome projectors will be facing upwards and will extend as part of a kind of a, a more surrounding kind of simulation. And the ride is also supposed to include three new audio animatronic figures. One is going to be stationary and two will quote unquote be able to walk around. Now, it's not clear if this is going to be Rex, if this is going to be characters from the original trilogy, the second trilogy or new characters altogether. Speaking of 3D enhancements, it's also been rumored that uh, at the studios, Muppet Vision 3D is going to be switched over to a digital projection system for much better quality, although no mention of any change to the film has actually taken place. Also at the studios, rumors of a new e-ticket attraction coming by 2010 are once again resurfacing. Now, these very well may be the aforementioned upgrades to Star Tours or a completely new attraction altogether. I'll of course report more on this as I hear it in the coming weeks and months. FastPass upgrades are going on at the studios as well. FastPass is going to be unavailable at Rock and Roller Coaster from July 12th through the 17th, and is also going to be unavailable from the Tower of Terror from July 25th through the I'm sorry, 23rd through the 25th. Back at the Magic Kingdom, an old rumor seems to be coming back to life once again. I previously reported about a Tinkerbell character meet and greet, with rumors surfacing again about it being located at the abandoned Skyway Station in Fantasyland and a new rumor of it being added to the Judge's Tent lineup in Mickey's Toontown Fair. Both rumors are consistent in that part of the story, you will walk through some sort of threshold that's going to give you the impression that you've been magically shrunk down to fairy size, so the life-size character you see of Tinkerbell means that you're both the same small size. It seems like the tweaking may not be done over at the Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor Comedy Club, as material is constantly being tested and changed, and we may see the addition of new material and skits and other portions removed over the next couple of months. A rumored new skit is the Comedy in a Box by Buddy Boyle, who's going to replace his mind-reading act. Enhancements may also allow backstage actors to have complete control of their characters and be able to direct them to do just uh, just about whatever they want, including the use of sound effects and props. So we'll have to keep an eye open uh, over the next few months as to what changes may be coming to the Monsters, Inc. laugh floor. And the old rumors coming back to life thread is showing up here again as the oft-rumored Space Mountain refurb is now claiming that in 2008, a very substantial upgrade may be taking place. Now, if these rumors are to be believed, you'll see changes to the queue and possibly the trains themselves, including the addition of a new digital audio system. Inside the show building, you're going to find upgrades to effects in the ceilings as part of the plan as other effects in the queue Uh, And if all these rumors are true, and that's a very big if, it may lead to a a very lengthy closure of the attraction for an extended period of time, possibly into the end of the year. I've heard from internal sources that Lucky the Dinosaur is back from Hong Kong Disneyland, but he's been placed in storage out in California. There are no plans to bring Lucky out of storage, even though he was exceptionally popular at, at both Hong Kong as well as Disney's Animal Kingdom. However, I have been told to look for more to come in the very near future as part of Disney's Living Character Initiative, where you're going to see audio animatronics not only be more free-roaming, but much more interactive with guests. Changes are moving forward with the new Spaceship Earth attraction as casting has begun for voice work, including rumors of a recent casting call for a 10-year-old male to play the voice of a newsboy for a Civil War sequence. This is consistent with Disney's recent press release, which read, in part, On a trip through time inside the Spaceship Earth attraction, guests discover how each generation of mankind has invented the future for the next generation and how the spirit of innovation has moved people from the caves to the cosmos. 
Enhancements to the time travel attraction will encompass changes to each of the ride scenes. New show scenes will be added to the attraction's story, along with new lighting effects, costumes, set decoration, narration, and musical score. So in keeping with the change to Siemens as the corporate sponsor, we may be getting away from the communication theme as well as seeing a completely new attraction as obviously, well, a new script. If you have any rumors that you want to share, send an email to lou at wdwradio.com. You can also call the voicemail at 206 202 for WDW, and if you want to talk about any of these, visit the WDW Radio message forums over at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. It's been a long time since we've done a fact or fiction segment here on the WDW radio show. So I wanted to uh, to do one this week. And this week we, we have a special guest and his name is Cody. And uh, if you listen to the WDW Today show, you may remember Cody because I was on that show a while back. And we did a uh, Who Wants to Earn Their Ears, I think was the name of it. And people would call up and it was a live show. And uh, I'd ask them trivia questions. I'd ask them 10 trivia questions. And if they got all 10 right, they could win some not so valuable prize like trivia books and the like. Well, only one person got all of them right, and that was Cody. Cody, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, Lou. Cody, how old are you? I am 13, turning 14 in two weeks. All right. Cody uh, Cody bested everybody else that had called in, and I, and I didn't give him any softballs. Cody knows his stuff. And uh, much to my surprise, I come to find out, Cody, Cody, what's your last name? Pepper. As in Cody Pepper, son of Jeff Pepper? Why, yes. <laughs> As in apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> yeah, Cody, I I, um, I didn't even know Jeff at the time, but as fate would have it, we all know Jeff is on the show all the time, and uh, Cody obviously knows his Disney stuff as well. So <laughs> we thought it would be fun to have Cody back, do a little fact or fiction. There are no valuable or non-valuable prizes. This is all just for fun, but... Uh, <laughs> Cody, did, did you bring your A game tonight? Oh, yeah. All right. You're going down, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you never know. You might, you might end up replacing Dad, so we'll see how <laughs> you do. <laughs> All right, Cody, here's your first one, fact or fiction. The dimensional duplicator can be found in Stitch's Great Escape. Fiction. Very good. Do you know where it is? No, I do not. I just know it's not there. (laughs) That's all right. As long as you get fiction right, that's all you need to know. Actually, you're right. The dimensional duplicator is used in Honey, I Shrunk the Audience over in Epcot's Future World. That's what Nick uses. That would have been my first guess, but I I honestly hadn't actually heard of that. That's all right. Good good deductive reasoning. All right, let's, uh, let's do number two. The song Golden Dreams can be heard at The American Adventure. Uh, Fact, I believe. Two for two. Two for two. That is the theme song for the American Adventure. It was written by Bob Moline in 1980. Uh, back in 1993, they actually changed um, the people who sing the song. It, it, the, it's a little bit longer than it was before. The ending is a little bit different, but it's still called Golden Dreams. All right. You're two for two. Let's see what a big Star Wars geek you are. Your destination in Star Tours is Tatooine. Oh, that is definitely fiction. It's the moon of Endor. Very good. See, it's not even Endor. You got the moon of Endor. Bravo. (laughs) Bravo. All right, you're three for three. Let's keep it going. See how well you know your animation and your ties to uh, to Disney World, much like your dad. Because the woman whose voice is heard as Madame Leota is also the same woman that voiced Maleficent. That is fiction. I believe she was an Imagineer. The woman whose voice is heard as Madame Leota. Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> Just say fact, say fact. <laughs> fact. Yeah, it's a little Boy, bit I screwed tricky. that one up. Yeah. 
That's all right. It was tricky because Eleanor Audley, who also played Lady Tremaine in Cinderella, um, was the voice of Madame Leota. Now, what you were thinking of, so you kind of get credit for this one, was that the face of Madame Leota was not Eleanor Audley. That was actually the woman Leota Toombs. She was one of the Imagineers who worked on the attraction, and kind of ironic that her last name is Toombs, and we're talking about the Haunted Mansion. So you're still going to get credit for that one because you had the uh, you had the important part of it right. So, <laughs> All right, halfway point. Let's see how we're doing. Number five. Mickey's Toontown Fair was originally known as Mickey's Starland. No, it was Mickey's Birthday Land. That's fiction. Very good. That's right. It was originally known as Mickey's Birthday Land from June 18th, 1988 to April 22nd, 1990. Then, because it was so popular, you know, they kept it going. It was supposed to be a temporary land. They kept it going, and it became Mickey's Starland on May 26th, 1990. And they kind of changed a little bit of the theming, and you saw some... Uh, a lot of characters from Disney afternoon shows like DuckTales and Gummy Bears and Rescue Rangers, whatnot. So, all right. Now, Cody, if you listen to the show, you know I like food. And if you see me in person, you definitely know I like food. So, <laughs> the Princess Storybook Breakfast can be found in Cinderella Castle. Princess Storybook uh, Breakfast. I want to say fiction because I thought that was it. Norway, but that could be a different princess breakfast. Cody, you definitely, you got a good night's sleep. You ate your Wheaties because you are six for six. That's right. <laughs> princess Storybook Dining takes place at Akershus in Norway, where they have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, in kind of the Norwegian-style castle. We can meet um, a lot of different Disney princesses, although Cinderella is not one of them. So, um, all right, let's head on back to the Magic Kingdom for number seven. Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin occupies the space that was once home to If You Had Wings. Oh, that's definitely fact. Very good. Because it uses the same ride track, I think. That's right. Do you remember any of the other attractions that used to be in there? Dream Flight, and that's... I'm trying to think. can't think of anything else, but I know there was... Wasn't there something else? Yeah, it was If You Could Fly. After Eastern lost her sponsorship, it was If You Could Fly, then Dream Flight, then Take Flight... And I got Buzz Lightyear in there, so. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see if you definitely pay attention to the show, especially when your dad is on. Did you listen to the, to the show about Communicore? Have you heard that yet? Uh, I caught parts of it. I haven't gotten it all yet. All right. The Astuter Computer Review uh, was replaced by Backstage Magic. That, that's not the fact or fiction part. <laughs> okay. Here's the, here's the question for you. The new host that your dad had, or I should say has, a crush on was named Sherry. I believe that was fiction. I mean, fact, sorry. No, nope, you're, yeah, you're right the first time, so you get credit. So <laughs> it was actually nope. Julie. Uh, yep. Go into your dad's room. I'm sure he has a little shrine to Julie somewhere uh, buried in the corner of his office. So, <laughs> All right. We're going to see how well you know World Showcase. Because the country located between the UK and Morocco in World Showcase is France. Between the UK and Morocco is France. Fact. Very good. Very good. Going from, in a clockwise manner, if you kind of walk in from Future World, you have Mexico, Norway, China, Germany, Italy, United States, Japan, Morocco, France, the UK, and Canada. All right, so so by my estimations, you are nine for nine. You were going to go for ten. We're going to go for the uh, for the trifecta here. The Maharaja Jungle Trek was originally known as the Pangani Forest Exploration Trail. Fiction. They are two separate uh, trails. Cody, you never cease to impress. I totally thought I had you on that last one. <laughs> Very good. The Gorilla's Falls Exp- uh, Exploration Trail, uh, which is now known as the Pangani Forest Exploration Trail, is very different than the, the Maharaja <laughs> Jungle Trek. You're right. They are two separate attractions. And uh, wow. Well, there you go. I'm throwing away my notes. Uh, bravo. <laughs> good for you. Cody, you are once again 10 for 10, although this time you win nothing. But uh, you you go home with a sense of knowing that you got all 10, and I'm going to have to have you back again. I clearly see that I need to make the the questions a little bit tougher next time. Oh, can't trick me. (laughs) Well, I am very impressed. I am very impressed, not just for a 13-year-old, excuse me, almost 14-year-old, 
but uh, <laughs> you, you definitely know your Disney stuff. You know your Walt Disney World. So uh, kudos to you, and I'm sure your dad will be giving himself, you know, pats on the back, saying, "Oh, look, look what I taught my son." So, or is well, it the other way around? Are you are you the one teaching your dad, or is he the one teaching you? Well, uh, <laughs> don't tell anybody else this, but uh, it's kind of not as it seems. I'm the one teaching him. Yeah. I figured as much. Listen, there's always <laughs> there's always a place for you here on the WDW Radio Show. So. Cody, buddy, thanks very much again. Congratulations on getting all 10. Uh, there were definitely some tricky ones in there, so I was very, very impressed. Thank you. It was my pleasure. All right, buddy. I'll see you soon. <laughs> see ya. This week's hidden treasure of Walt Disney World, once again, surprise, surprise, revolves around food. And I wanted to bring back another friend of the show who uh, I know appreciates it as much as I do. And that's Gary Chambers from the, from the Mouse Lounge podcast. Gary, welcome back. Glad to be here, Lou. And especially if we're going to talk about food. <laughs> well, now I'm all about that. Let's talk about food. That's all. Well, three hours of nothing but food talk about. <laughs> we probably could do it very easily, too. But uh, we had a chance to meet back in January in Walt Disney World, and we shared a meal over at the Beer Garden in Germany. But right by that restaurant is something that I consider, and I know you do as well, one of Walt Disney World's hidden treasures, and that's the Summerfest. That's the, the Pavilion's walk-up restaurant that's right near the entrance of, uh, of the Beer Garden. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about um, the restaurant and why you think it's a, a hidden treasure. Summerfest is remarkable for several reasons. First of all, if you're walking through World Showcase and you even go into the German Pavilion and look around and perhaps duck into the wine shop, you can't see it. It's not there. It's not present. It doesn't really have a, a visual facade to, uh, to draw you in. What you have to do is pretend as though you are going to go into the beer garden and just as you pass a center pillar, you turn to your right and there it is. There's Summerfest. It's actually a walk-up window that you can order these wonderful German foods and they're, they're German fast food such as the pretzels and sauerkraut and things of that nature Brought and worst. some German wines brought, oh, the can't miss the worst. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't get me started on that bratwurst. And the funny thing is, is that when you get there and you place your order and you, you get your food rather quickly, there really isn't a whole huge place to go if you look set back from behind the window there's a few seats that are there it's all covered and because of the stonework that's there if it's hot outside you can actually just retreat and relax cool down have that snack and it's something that's so much better than 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 just going up to any of the other uh, uh, service counters and getting french fries and a coke I mean this is really hearty food that's almost a meal but even if you just go through one of those pretzels, you'll be hard-pressed to have dinner a couple of hours later. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, even above and beyond uh, the menu, and we'll talk a little bit more about what is actually on it and, and the fact that I think it's a good value, too, for what you get. But the plaza is actually very nice. And again, it, unless you're going to the beer garden, like you said, I think most people walk by and have no idea that it's there. Uh, there is a row of seats up against a mural in the back of the, of the plaza. Of course, as in everything in Disney, uh, especially the Germany Pavilion, very wonderfully themed. Um, a lot to look at. Very, very cool. Very quiet. Very out of the way. But again, talk about the food specifically. There are things like bratwurst with sauerkraut. And it's, again, only $6.39. You could make a full meal out of that. There's frankfurters, pretzels, apple strudel, fat-free, I'm sure, black forest cake, a selection of German beers, wines, cheesecakes, shots if you're so inclined such as Jägermeister or Goldschlager <laughs> family friendly show um, as well as other drinks and, and things like that but uh, a, a real nice out of the way place and again very very hidden because it's so off the beaten path it's not on the promenade all around the lagoon so I think most people unless you've eaten at Beer Garden probably don't even know about it it's really nice if you if you have it's not so hot outside you can get your food and then retreat into or actually do it beforehand the wine shop that's right there they, they sell the wine by the bottle and if you're a little sneaky about it and using the plastic cups you can actually get a nice bottle of Heil Sue Hernsheim wine that they have there this is actually the winery that my wife interned at back in 1999 in Nierstein, Germany and they actually sell it in the German pavilion which was a real surprise the first time I went 
2004. So if you've got your nice bottle of wine and your pretzel or your sauerbraten and your bratwurst, you can either sit back there behind the mural where it's cool, or if you're really clever, you can just sashay around the corner and take in the garden that has mm -hmm. the miniature train that runs around. Nice place to retreat and people watch and have a glass of wine and your food. Nice, nice little hidden treasure. Absolutely. Great food, great atmosphere, um, very inexpensive. Uh, something a little bit different. So, yeah, that's why we think Summerfest over in the Germany Pavilion is a is a, not only a great counter-service meal, but one of Walt Disney World's hidden treasures. Again, Gary Chambers from the Mouse Lounge Podcast. I want to thank you for coming on and once again, making me hungry. Oh, like it's my fault? <laughs> it's always You made me fault. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, buddy. My pleasure. Another way that Walt Disney World pays incredible attention to detail is not just in the theming and the story, but in the connections to characters from Disney animated films and Disney live action films throughout history. And somebody that knows a whole lot about this and, and really is passionate about it is, of course, Jeff Pepper. He runs a 2719hyperion.blogspot.com. I guess I should stop introducing him since you probably know who he is by, right by now. But Jeff, welcome back, buddy. Hey, Lou. Thanks, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, Jeff, you, you're a huge animation fan, and, and you've actually turned me on to a lot of some of the other little details and some of the other little references um, to characters in and around the parks and some of the details that we see. And one of the characters that I think probably a lot of people walk right by for one reason or another can be found over in Mickey's Toontown Fair. And uh, he just a little, deserves a little bit more respect than he's getting, um, especially since he, um, he has a very big connection to Mickey's Toontown Fair, and that is Cornelius Coote. Yeah, Cornelius Coot is a bit of an anomaly because he's not even as immediately recognizable as a lot of people would naturally think when, you know, we, we talked about Humphrey Bear and actually Humphrey Bear was in some cartoons and, you know, it's, it's funny because Cornelius Coot never was in a cartoon. His reference is all the more obscure, but just again, as you just said, really shows the great lengths that the Imagineers go to detail. And in this case, it wasn't actually, I believe, the Imagineers who actually came up with this. Uh, Cornelius Coote's origins in Mickey's Toontown Fair kind of go back a little further than Toontown Fair. They go all the way back to when it was originally conceived as Mickey's Birthday Land in 1988. And if uh, you recall, uh, Charles Widge Ridgway excuse me, um, t tells a story in his book about how literally Mickey's, uh, or Mickey's Birthday Land excuse me, was literally just almost created overnight. And it was created so quickly that Imagineering really didn't get involved because they were very busy at the time uh, doing uh, building MGM Studios. And what they did in creating Mickey's Birthday Land is they actually based it on Duckburg, which was actually, actually the setting of the Donald Duck comic books that were going back to the 1940s and 1950s. And the person, the creative person behind Duckburg in those comic books was by and large Carl Barks. And most... You know, Disney Anna fans, even if they're not big, big comic book readers, are generally familiar with the name Carl Barks and the fact that he was very instrumental and, uh, and actually at this point legendary in, in his efforts on behalf of those comic books at the time. And going back, they based a lot of things in Birthday Land on this sort of setting of Duckburg, and it was this kind of weird connection because Duckburg was, they said, home of Mickey Mouse, but it was actually the home of Donald Duck. <laughs> 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 Not sure where you know, um, you know, you know. Mickey actually in in the comic books he was uh, alternately referred to as living in Mouse Town or Mouseville, so it's it's kind of a little bit of a weird connection. But it was very interesting because you know clearly when they did it, you know, ninety percent of the people probably weren't going to get it, but they 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 truly enjoyed playing up that angle. Well, the statue of Cornelius Coote is actually derived from a 1952 comic book called the Statuesque Spinthrus Spinthrus and. This uh, story revolved around a statue of Cornelius Coote, who was identified as the founder of Duckburg. And that's exactly when they recreated um, that. That's how they recreated the original statue. In fact, we have pictures that show Cornelius Coote as he originally appeared when it was Mickey's birthday land, and it very distinctly says founder of Duckburg. And the story basically dealt you know, with Uncle Scrooge McDuck you know, in a rivalry of sorts between him and another billionaire who were trying to outdo themselves by donating the biggest statue to the city, and the statue was of Coot, and that was kind of the basis. 
But it just, again, like it shows you, shows you the great lengths to which they were fairly authentic because at that point in time, you know, it was a one shot. I mean, Cornelius Coot literally just appeared in this one Karl Barks comic book story, yet they were that authentic in bringing it to, um, to Mickey's Birthday Land. Now, when uh, Mickey's Birthday Land switched over to Mickey's Toontown Fair, they did something that, you know, if there's any comic book fans out there listening, there's, you know, the little buzzword that's been in comic books, you know, is the, the term retrocon, which stands for retro continuity, where there's, you know, when Superman gets too old, they have to kind of rewrite his backstory because, you know, he just can't be, keep, be the same age for, you know, 50, 60 years or whatever. Well, they kind of did that with Cornelius Coote, and suddenly he, his entire Duckburg background evaporated with Mickey's Birthday Land, and if you look at the plaque now he's standing actually on two sculpted ears of corns and there's a plaque in front that reads this is old Cornelius Coot turned his corn crop corn crop into loot and founded Mickey's Toontown Fair to him we dedicate this square so basically they had a really nice statue and they wanted to keep using it <laughs> well I'm trying to remember now what was that statue I don't remember that statue in birthday land I remember the sign that said welcome to Duckburg um and I remember the sign said it was like population billions, as in billions, and, yeah, and you still saw growing. That actually, yeah, as you actually approached on the train, that was that way, I believe. No, the, the, the statue, the original Birthday Land statue um, that had him as the founder of Duck, Duck, Duckburg is in the exact same place. If you remember where the large tent, what do they refer to the tent as now? The, the judge's tent? Where the meet and, yeah, the judge's tent, where the meet and greets all were. That was originally, similarly still a tent. They didn't change the architecture too dramatically on it. But it was originally the Duckburg Courthouse, and Cornelius Coote's original statue was exactly where it is now, just it had a different styling to it. It was done more like a sort of marble, granite kind of base, you know, and it had the big plaque on it that said founder of Duckburg. And when uh, when Duckburg went rural, <laughs> so did the statue. <laughs> yeah, now he's standing on corn, so I suppose. Yeah. Right. But, you know, that is the, the authentic, true history of Cornelius Coote. But again, um, we'll put, there's a post up that I have on my blog, and we'll link to it. It will actually shows you the panel from the original comic book, and the actual recreation of the statue is totally, totally faithful to the way Carl Barks drew it over, you know, 50 years ago. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and it's one of those, you know, secondary characters that, unless maybe you were a fan of the comic books or or Carl Barks' work, you might not know who he is. Um, was he ever in? Uh, any of like the Scrooge McDuck, you know, cartoons and things like that that may have been on on you know the Disney cartoon. You know, we'll have to throw that out to our listeners because, to my knowledge, I don't remember. But you know, there was the Ducktales, you know, TV show, and they based quite a number of uh, stories, you know, shows on some of the Carl Barks material. And there could have been a reference there or an actual appearance. I just can't remember. I do know that um, Don Rosa, who is a very very celebrated comic book uh, creator now, and he actually does a great deal of Donald Duck uh, Uncle Scrooge comics, but he primarily produces them overseas, and they do ultimately see reprints over here. The overseas market for comic books is, for Disney comics, is dramatically greater than it is here in the United States. Uh, you, you go into Europe, and these comic books are still very, very popular. And Don does a lot of um, you know, kind of sequels, and he's very, he's very much in the Carl Barks mode. He he loves Carl Barks, and he he likes to pay homage to him whenever he can. And he's actually used the Cornelius Coot character, and he he actually brings him in to a historical context. In fact, he did a very big opus kind of graphic novel collection that was the Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck, that basically was Uncle Scrooge's biography, and it shows the context of the founding of Duckburg and Cornelius Coot actually dealing with. Um, Uncle Scrooge or members of Cornelius Scoot's family dealing with Uncle Scrooge. I don't remember the exact details. So he did kind of reappear there, but I don't know that I, I've ever actually seen him in animated form. Hmm. All right, well, there you go. So, yeah, another one of those the secondary characters, a, a great detail, again, that, that most people probably walk by and don't even read the, read the little inscription or, or know who the character is. So I appreciate you kind of pointing out to, uh, to me and to everybody else 
who he is and his relation to the Disney universe. And uh, we'll keep these going. People seem to really enjoy some of these ties to these characters that they can be found in and around the park. So if you see a character, if you see something, a detail, and maybe a character there that you don't know who he is or, or she is or it is, I guess, uh, you can go ahead and send us a picture or send us a, a question or an email or a voicemail, and we'll try and uh, see if we can figure it out and highlight it for you on the show. Jeff, again, from 2719hyperion.blogspot.com. Excellent work again. Thanks a lot, buddy. Anytime, Lou. Glad to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Yeah, Bill, what the hell? We come seek an adventure in salty old pirates, eh? Amigos, amigos down there. It is me up here. Rain fighter, I'm just right. Uh-huh. Welcome to the voices behind the magic. Hello, and welcome back to the voices behind the magic. This week on Voices Behind the Magic... We profile Tony-winning, Golden Globe-winning, Oscar-nominated, and Emmy-nominated actress Angela Lansbury, best known in recent memory for playing Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote. Born October 16, 1925, in London, Angela Lansbury very quickly rose through the ranks of the acting elite. There may be something there that wasn't there before. In her 1944 film debut in Gaslight, she was nominated for her very first Academy Award. And the very next year garnered another nomination for her portrayal of Sybil Vane in Dorian Gray. Starting in 1964, Angela was a prolific Broadway actress, appearing in numerous shows and holding the distinction of having won every Tony Award she had ever been nominated for, with the exception of a nomination in 2007. We've got a lot to do. Is it one, not for two? For you, I guess. She's our guest. Her long and storied film career includes such classics as Samson and Delilah, A Lawless Street, The Court Jester, Blue Hawaii, The Manchurian Candidate, The Greatest Story Ever Told, and several Agatha Christie mysteries. However, to Disney fans, she will always be known as both Eglantine Price in Bedknobs and Broomsticks, Traguna. Macoides, Tricorum, Satis D. And the lovable Mrs. Potts in 1991's Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Mrs. Potts, the matriarch of the cursed castle, appeared always ready to entertain guests and try to show the softer side of the beast. Tale as old as time True as it can be Barely even friends Then somebody bends Unexpectedly Angela reprised the role in the 2006 video game Kingdom Hearts 2 as well as providing additional voice work for Fantasia 2000 and Mickey's Philharmagic. Despite having only two major Disney motion pictures, Bedknobs and Broomsticks and Beauty and the Beast, to her credit, Angela Lansbury was made a Disney legend in 1995. She received a Screen Actors Guild Lifetime Achievement Award in 1997, was awarded the Kennedy Center Honors in 2000, and currently has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme, beauty and the beast. Although she is probably most well known for her 12 year career as Jessica Fletcher on Murder She Wrote, but to Disney fans who in 1991 saw Angela's song nominated for and winning the Best Picture Oscar, and Beauty and the Beast nominated for Best Picture, Mrs. Potts and Angela 
will always be some of the voices behind the magic. Off to the cupboard with you now, Chip. It's past your bedtime. Good night, love. For this week's Best of the Best segment, we've brought back another very special guest. We want to welcome Mike Scopa from MousePlanet.com and co-host of the WDW Today podcast back to the show. Mike, thanks for coming back. Hey, how's it going, Lou? It's easy for you to say that, I guess. (laughs) Mike, we wanted to enlist your help this week because this week for our Best of the Best segment, we wanted to find out what's the best general guideline for touring the parks you know there's plenty of of ways to do it and you know obviously we we highly recommend touringplans.com and the unofficial guide for uh, to come up with detailed touring plans but for people that may not want to do that to follow a specific structure what's the best kind of general rule for touring the, the theme parks at walt disney world wow um well i think that if you you ask that of 100 people you'd probably get 100 different answers i know that uh, a lot of people will, a lot of guests will uh, go to their favorite theme park and the first thing they would uh, focus on is um, their favorite attractions and um, that would be the very first thing they do. Uh, hmm. For me, what seems to work for me is that if I'm going into a park and I am focused on doing uh, 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 a good chunk of attractions, what seems to work and has been working for me for the last 30 years is just going through the 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 park in a, in a counterclockwise uh, manner. For instance, uh, my wife Carol and I a few years ago we we were down in uh, Orlando on July 4th and we said, hey, let's let's go to the Magic Kingdom on uh, on this 4th of July and let's see what we can do. And we tried to figure out on the way what would be the we- best way to uh, tour the 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 park. Now we had already been in the park a few days earlier, so we didn't have to do everything, but we wanted to see how well a, a certain idea would work. So what we did is we went in and we just did counterclockwise. We started with Tomorrowland, we worked our way around Fantasyland, and eventually to Adventureland. Now we did everything but the mountains. We did everything but Splash, Big Thunder, and Space Mountain. But we ended up being finished with everything we wanted to do. By about 11:30, so so that that seemed to work. When when you go into uh, uh, World Showcase, the same thing. We just work our way around from from right to left. We do counterclockwise. Um, same thing for MGM Studios, although that works really well for MGM Studios because you go down Sunset Boulevard and you take care of Rock and Roller Coaster and Tower of Terror, and then you then you work your way around. Not got the two fi- ones, right? Yeah, finally, and 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 then uh, in the Animal Kingdom, uh, same thing. Even now, you've got if you walk to the right, you can do Everest. Uh, we used to do, uh, you do dinosaur, and you do Tarzan rocks, and then you eventually you work your way around to Festival of the Lion King. But that seems to work. I, I would say that that is the the as far as I'm concerned, that works best for me, Lou, because I've tried others, and there's there's a consistency to doing it this way. I know what to expect, and for the most part, I'm I'm really getting through the parks in a pretty good time frame whereas if I try it a different way like if I do the most popular ones early on because I know that they may have uh, they may have queue lines that are much longer in the afternoon what happens is that if I do them early then those attractions which are not that popular will have long lines by the time I get to them so by doing this in a sort of a counterclockwise uh, way, I, I, I tend to know what's going to happen. I'm always expecting like certain attractions to be a little bit longer for queues than others, but for the most part, it's it's very manageable, and I usually don't wait more than 20 minutes in line. You know, and if it works for you at the Magic Kingdom on July 4th, it would probably work anywhere. Now, you know, as you were saying it, I kind of were going through the park maps in my mind, and I guess I, I could see how you could do it really for all the four theme parks. You could. You could. Uh, again, it, it, one of the things that that I need to, uh, to to put in here and 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 Len, if Len was here, Len Len uh, 
Lentesta, he would he would also reinforce this idea. It also depends upon the day of the week. Uh, there are certain days of the week that you really want to avoid certain parks. Like you really want to avoid Magic Kingdom on Mondays. You really want to avoid Epcot on Tuesdays, uh, MGM on Wednesdays, and uh, the Disney's Animal Kingdom on Thursdays. Um, so those days, if you happen to go to the parks on those days, I would almost have to say all bets are off as far as uh, as this philosophy goes, because the crowds are going to be a little bit extra, extra, uh, extra uh, high. Also, I would, I would tend to think that if all the attractions are open on the extra magic hour mornings, this touring approach would work. Um, if not, all the attractions are open on mornings, then I would not use this because. As we both know, with the extra magic hour mornings, what happens is that by mid-morning, uh, that theme park that is offering the extra magic hour mornings is probably going to swell to about 20% more uh, than they would normally have for that morning. So there's, those are two little caveats that I want to throw in there. Hmm. But yeah, I, I can see how this would work, you know, definitely on a general sense. And, and like I said at the beginning, half-jokingly, if you do want to do it, you know, with a little bit more of a structured approach and uh, in a way that's, you know, garnished years of detailed research and heavy-duty computing power and things like that, I'd recommend <laughs> you go over to uh, Len Teston's site over at touringplans.com and pick up a copy of uh, what I consider to be the, the Disney Planning Bible, and that's the unofficial guide to Walt Disney World. I agree. He's got a lot of scientific data that is fed there almost every single day, and uh, you, the numbers just don't lie. They just don't lie. Yeah, I interviewed Len uh, once before, and it's really kind of scary when you realize how much research really does. You know, it's not people guessing that this is where we think you should go or, you know, this is what we – there, there's definitely, you know, empirical data that they've taken over years um, all throughout the year that, that kind of validate and back up everything that they say in that book. I, I can tell you, Lou, I mean, I have, a, I have an example. Uh, la- earlier la- last year, I think it was uh, in May – I was down there on a solo trip. I was also running in the mini marathon in May, and I happened to be in uh, in the Magic Kingdom, and I was in front of Splash Mountain, and I called Len, and I said, Hey, Len, just thought I'd give you the wait times. It's uh, a Thursday. It's 1 o'clock <laughs> afternoon, and the wait time for Splash Mountain is uh, 45 minutes. And um, he said, Let me check. <laughs> he said, Oh, man. He said, We were off by seven minutes. He had predicted it would be like seven minutes longer, because it was like the third. It was like the second week in May. It was the second Thursday in May, and that's that's how how accurate their their uh, their their numbers were. So so yeah, I, I I you know I I would say that you know their numbers are, are very very credible. Yeah, you can definitely trust what you're reading there. And again, I'll put links to both of those up in the show notes. But uh, so your your best general rule for for touring the Walt Disney World theme parks heading counterclockwise that comes from the expert himself, Mike Scopa. Uh, Again, you can read his columns over at mouseplanet.com. Listen to his podcast over at WDW along with that fella, Len Testa. And uh, Mike, thank you again for uh, all your help and expertise on this week's Best of the Best segment. My pleasure, Luke. Thanks for having me. Hello there, WDW Radio Show listeners. This is Eric Hollister from Geomouse.com, and we are here with you for an update in our challenge series for the Half Marathon Challenge. And before we get to this week's winner, we want to go ahead and thank everyone for their participation for Challenge 1. And before I announce the winner, I want to go over the answers to lose trivia questions. Uh, first, what was the name of the warden in the Kilimanjaro Safaris? It was Wilson Matua. Warden Wilson Matua was the answer. Who were the two previous sponsors for Space Mountain in the Magic Kingdom? It was RCA and FedEx. And finally, what award did Professor Wayne Zielinski win? And for all of us who know that or have seen the Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, we know that he won the Inventor of the Year Award. So again, thank you everybody for your submissions, and we pulled together all correct answers that were submitted by June 11th at 11.59 p.m., and I would like to announce that the winner for contest number one is Tracy Cherry. And Tracy wins both Walt Disney World Trivia Books Volumes 1 and 2, signed by Lou Mangiello, a DisneyWorldTrivia.com t-shirt, a Disney trivia lanyard and trading pin, the Jack Sparrow and Davy Jones bobblehead figures, and also Tracy will receive a certificate of dedication for the first mile marker, which shall be called 
a Lou beginning. Tracy will also be entered in our grand prize drawing, which will occur at the end of the Walt Disney World Half Marathon. Uh, and Lou and I will go ahead and announce that grand prize in a later show in the up and coming weeks. And finally, we're going to go ahead and uh, post Tracy's name and her mile marker on both uh, geomouse.com, and we'll include a link to it in the show notes. And, of course, this is all to raise money for a good cause, the Dream Team Project. Uh, Geomouse.com will donate $100 for the first mile marker uh, to the Dream Team Project, and we will continue to do this uh, throughout the Half Marathon Challenge Series. So this brings us to challenge number two in the WDW Half Marathon Challenge. And for the next contest, we're going to call on the help of Jonathan Dichter from the All About the Mouse podcast in voice of mousetunes.blogspot.com. Listen carefully, and I'll return to go over this week's contest rules. Hello, WDW Radio listeners. This is Jonathan Dichter, owner of of voiceofmousetunes.blogspot.com and co-host of the All About the Mouse Disney podcast, found at www.allaboutthemouse.com. I am here this week with your voices behind the movies, Marathon Challenge. In a moment, you'll hear ten clips from Disney songs, movies, and television. Your job, name the song, name the movie or television show it came from, name the actor, and name the character. Get them all correct, and you could be this week's Marathon Challenge winner. Good luck! Here they come. Traguna Macoides. Stick with me, and you'll never go hungry again. Come run the hidden pine trails of the forest. Come taste the sun sweet berries of the earth. All my life I wonder how it feels to pass a day not above hell. What part of that? My soul is there beside you. Let this candle guide you. I want to see, want to see them dancing. Oh, you can't see it, you know they are smiling. Each time someone shows. Vanish and breathe, that's me. Ever just the same. Ever a surprise. Red, yellow, green, red, blue, 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 red, purple, green, blue, purple, red, red. Alright folks, so your mission for challenge number two is to identify all four aspects of each one of the ten sound clips that John provided. Name the song, the show or movie that it was in, the actor or actress that sang the song, and the character they portrayed. All answers must be submitted to marathon at wdwradio.com by 11.59pm Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, July 25th, 2007. Also include the name of your mile marker, which will be designated as mile marker number two if you are chosen as the winner. We will go ahead and post this week's challenge along with the MP3 clip in the show notes and on geomouse.com so that way you can uh, go back and listen to it again. All correct submissions will once again be pulled together and will randomly draw a winner which will be announced on the WDW Radio Show podcast for the week of July 29th. And the winner will receive a prize package consisting of both Walt Disney World Trivia Books, Volumes 1 and 2, signed by Lou Mangiello, a DisneyWorldTrivia.com t-shirt, 
Disney trivia lanyard and trading pin. This week we're also going to include all of Walt Disney World on DVD, as well as both Remy and Linguini plush figures, uh, and of course those are both from the movie Ratatouille. The winner will also receive a another certificate of dedication to name mile marker number two. And we want to thank Jonathan Dichter uh, for helping us this week with challenge number two. Uh, You can hear Jonathan on the All About the Mouse podcast as well as visit his site, which is voiceofmousetunes.blogspot.com. We also on geomouse.com are going to include a link uh, to Lou's uh, Dream Team project if you want to go to the site and contribute yourself. Uh, as with the first challenge and the upcoming challenges, geomouse.com will continue to donate $100 per mile uh, to the Dream Team Project. So with that, we want to wish everybody good luck on this week's challenge, and we're now going to turn things back over to Lou. Thank you for tuning in once again this week, and I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to thank Jeff and Cody Pepper from 2719hyperion.blogspot.com, as well as my other guests, Gary Chambers from the Mouse Lounge podcast, Jonathan Dichter from the All About the Mouse podcast, and Mike Scopa from the Matt Hotchberg Comedy Hour show. Special thanks to Eric Hollister from geomouse.com for his work on the Half Marathon Challenge, and don't forget to get your entries in for this week's contest. Also visit our show notes page at wdwradio.com for more information, links and photos, as well as links to previous episodes of the show and our merchandise shop. If you're planning a Disney vacation, please also visit our friends at The Magic for Less Travel for a free, no obligation quote. Of course, I give them my highest recommendation due to their free service and commitment to outstanding personal service, as well as giving you the best possible prices and discounts. Visit the wdwradio.com website for a link to themagicforless.com. On upcoming shows, I have more in the Seven Wonders series, as well as Disney scene investigations, lots of vacation planning information with the help of some special guests. I promise to get to your email and so much more. I'll also talk about this weekend's amazing Magic Meets event, where I had the pleasure of meeting so many of you. Don't forget that I continue to want the show to be interactive, so email me at lou at wdwradio.com or call the voicemail anytime at 206 202-4WDW. You can call with a question, you can call with a comment, you can call from the parks, anything you like. If you have a suggestion for the show, by all means, send those in as well. Please come by our fun and friendly forums over at DisneyWorldTrivia.com for discussions about all things Disney. And of course, if you like the show, please help spread the word. Review us on iTunes or vote for the show by clicking on the dig button at the WDWRadio.com website. Thank you once again for tuning in this week. I really do appreciate you coming back. Have a fantastic week. See ya! Hi, Lou. This is Sue from Fairfax, Virginia. I was just listening to your show, number 22, and your discussion about the American Adventure. Um, I have to sheepishly say that we have never gone in and properly enjoyed everything in there, but we will be doing that in January (laughs) when we go for the half marathon. But what I wanted to comment about is um, how you all were talking about, some people criticized it, saying that it it doesn't have any of the negatives. Well, what countries do? When you want to showcase your country, you're not going to point out all the negative things that you've done. You want to point out your, your triumphs and your victories and the wonderful things about your country. I don't think that there's anything wrong with being a little mushy or patriotic. I think that's awesome, and I think too many people these days don't have that patriotism that the American Adventure is giving you. And, you know, it kind of brought tears to my eyes just listening to you guys talk about it, so I can't wait to see it in January. Well, thanks for everything you do. I love the show. Listen to it religiously every week, and I hope to see you in January at the Half Marathon. Bye. Matt, I have a question for you. Why are you so scared of dinosaur? It's scary. No, no. It's scary. Oh, I love, I love that ride. It's scary. I, I, uh... I've tried. You know the dinosaurs aren't real, right? Well, now, do you feel that way at the Universe of Energy? No, that's fine. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that one. I mean, those are pretty big dinosaurs, too, you know. I understand. There's some things that scare us, but, you know. It's scary.